living there. I'm still in Australia. Okay. Class. Class. Students. Young people. The state of American morality today is so decayed. I will make this country great. Great, I'll make this country. Um, hi. I just looked at my little clock and it said it was after one o'clock, so never having had the opportunity to stand here and discipline or try to organize unruly, amorous students and their relatives, it just seemed too good to pass up. Um, for, if you're in the right class, this is CAM 103. Um, no credit will be given. No one's allowed to go to graduate school. You're here for the love of your education. So I'm Keith Leslie. Um, some, many of you I know. Some know more about my life than they're allowed to say, and I will mention today. But um, I'd like to thank Bob Howard for asking me, inviting me to, to um, take this hour of your time and talk a bit about my life in Nepal. The earthquake that happened a year ago in Nepal and um, some of the complexities that, that occur when you have a national, natural disaster like that on a national scale. And um, um, let me just ask first, I mean, how many people have been to that petite little country over on the other side of the world? You're all excused. <laughs> um, so, uh, Before I start, I'd also just like to dedicate this to our friend Scott Leeper. I realized a couple of our friends here who were in our class didn't know until today that Scott passed away about six weeks ago. And um, Lee Wilson and I were both you know, very um, close to Scott at the time when he was dying. I was in New York and went home before he passed away and Lee was there right after he did. But a true inspiration for many of us, you'll see an obituary in the next Amherst magazine um, much of the life that I've lived um, was partially guided and made possible by Scott Leeper, who I met first day at Amherst when he stuck his head around the room and Lee in my room and said, anyone want to share a phone? I didn't realize at that time that meant share a life um, <laughs> because, you know, as one friend said, you know, years and years ago, it's like Scott and I were married. We were together for so long at Amherst, at Smith, traveling, etc. cetera. Um, grandson, son of Presbyterian missionaries in China, he had that, that beautiful spirit, you know, to give to the world and do something for the world, wild and crazy as he was in other ways. And it's, you'll see, as we say in that obituary, I honestly believe there's not a single American who's done, who did more for the people of Cambodia after the, the Vietnam War, the American War, than Scott Leeper, who lived there from the mid 80s until he passed away, working on a national rural reconstruction program. So. Wonderful, wonderful man, and I bless his soul. I'm going to try and, and put a lot into about 30 minutes and then hopefully have some questions and discussion. Um, you know, quick overview, travel beyond the beyond. How did I get to Nepal? How did this life occur? A little bit of my life in Nepal, overview of Nepali history, and there will be an exam. Vichalo Ayo, Vichalo Ayo. I mean, you can almost hear what it says. I heard it in 1988 when I was recently married. And we woke up and the animals were crying in the, in the neighborhood and the chokidar, the guard, was going, Buichalo Ayo, Buichalo Ayo. Didn't take a lot to understand when the house is moving what Buichalo Ayo meant. You know, that the earthquakes come, earthquakes coming. The 1988 was a preliminary to what we felt in, in 2015 last year. And I'll go through a bit of, you know, what the earthquake was for us and then as some of you know, and Bob knew very well, Shakun, my wife, and I set up the Nepal Villagers Earthquake Fund immediately after the earthquake, and people were incredibly generous to support us, and we worked through my wife's NGO to do relief work and then reconstruction work, and I'll show you a bit of that. And the final couple slides will be about the national sociopolitical issues related to the earthquake, because whatever we did on a small scale through one NGO, you have 650,000 houses, I haven't counted, but that's what they say, across the hills of, and mountains of Nepal that collapse, basically. So a bit of a national emergency, even though our political class tends to ignore that. Scott and I wrote a lot while we traveled. You know, I had a Saul Bellow quote here and a Jung quote. I figured if I'm going to move through this 
cut things back. But the Jung quote was when I was reading Memory, Dreams, and Reflections, his autobiography, when we started to travel. And we traveled for three years. We were good. Um, very low cost, much less than, you know, than most master's programs we could have applied to. And um, this, this line just meant a lot to me, that there's no linear evolution. At the end, everything points towards the center. Now that many of us are over 60 and later, um, becomes an important point of our life. What was the purpose when we started out in that linear way at Amherst with our grades, with our professions, with our marriage, with our kids, with you know, our incomes? You know, at this point in our life, it really looks at you know, what was the purpose? What did, what did we do with our lives? What was meaningful to us? And at that point, that struck me that uniform development at best is at the beginning. The rest is who we are. Your karma ran over my dogma, as they say. How the hell did I end up, a kid born in Stephenville, Newland, raised in upstate New York, you know, um, immigrant Jewish parents from, you know, on one side, you know, well-established New York on the other side. How did I end up spending most of my life in Nepal? I've been there since 1983. I went there first in 79. Well, some years ago, in my first seven-year childhood book, you know, as I was looking through it, the birth announcement my grandparents, who were those type of people, put in the New York Herald Tribune fell out, this little plasticine thing. On the back side of this, you know, less than one inch by one inch, you know, piece of newspaper, the conquest of Everest. <laughs> For a guy who's gonna spend 40 years of his life in Nepal, it's like, you know, who figured that one out beforehand? <laughs> You know, because Hillary and Tenzing Norgay had climbed Everest in 53 and it was showing in New York and my parents never took me. Um, so someone's karma ran over my dogma. You know, there was something about Nepal, you know, it's, um, I remember when I first went to Europe and as a teenager, news, late night, staying up, the movie I watched before I went to Montreal the next morning to fly to Europe was The Lost Horizon, Ronald Coleman, Sam Jaffe, 1937 for people who have seen it. There was something very evocative. Scott and I both studied philosophy, religion at Amherst, had Bob Thurman as a teacher. It was those type of days. Um, something was very appealing. And also, just getting out of the States was very powerful emotion for me. And uh, you know, Scott, who again, you know, long tradition of, of missionary work in China. Walter Cronkite saying, that's the way it is, you know, um, Friday, et cetera, et cetera, 19, 2015. Just, 16, Walter, there's more out there. I wanted to see the world. It was just a desperate need to know what was out in this world that we're living in. And so Scott and I, Scott worked in New Orleans for a little bit on oil rigs. I worked in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Senate for a little bit. And then we, we disappeared. Um, and to be honest, neither of us ever really came home again. This summer, I'm going to be here until September. It'll be the longest time in, I'm in the States since 1977 for people who can remember 1977. And Scott and I just, we meandered, we wandered, we wrote, we read, we explored, and through all these countries, and my top five, which are um, in italics here, Morocco, Kenya, Turkey, Nepal, and Thailand, of all these 20 some odd countries we traveled through, something remarkable about each of them. All this stuff down below are just some of the remarkable places that mo most of those we had never heard of before we even got on the road. Because people tell you what's next, what's next? There's a circuit of people following Ibn Battuta around the, the, you know, the world. You know, places of such, I mean, you see Palmyra, which is in the news from, from Syria. Dur Europa is off on the, you know, the Syrian, Iraqi, Turkish border. Incredible Hellenic site. Um, it was just a gift of exploration for us. But it opened up, you know, Pandora's box or, you know, falling down, you know, Alice in Wonderland's, you know, that we never got back. The world just, because I had a letter from a guy I was working for in Washington to Senator Percy saying, Keith is going to travel for six months, come back and go to law school. <laughs> um, it was an idea. An idea of this move, too. Okay. So just some visuals. I mean, Scott and I just being, you know, as foolish as we were at college in our own way. Mount Athos with a, with a, with a uh, Greek, um, at Mount Athos, the, the hello. Um, we spent our first Easter in the Grand Chartreuse up in, in by Grenoble um, with an American monk there, incredibly beautiful, peaceful, you know, you know uh, um, monastery, abbey, high up in the mountains. A year later, we spent the next Orthodox Greek e Easter at Mount Athos. Absolutely magnificent. I mean, this huge Christ, Christos Anestes, through these, you know, 20-foot 
brass candelabras with Christ up on the, the cupola. Um, magnificent. It was just the world opened up in a way that was hard to close for us. We were, we were very bad boys. We climbed up to the top of one of the pyramids as the guards going, no, 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 I'll, I'll come down. You know, but it was not today with the security you have around the world. We traveled around Africa, Sudan. We never thought of these things. Syria, we spent about six weeks. So we climbed up to the top of the pyramid where that picture was taken. And then here's Lee, who's in the audience with Scott, our friend Dave, and myself on our trek around the, the Annapurnas when I really fell into the world and realized I'm not coming home soon. Soon this became, you know, my mother's still waiting. <laughs> I met my wife, Shakun Sherchan, um, who, you know, I wish she could be here. We have a daughter who's finishing up high school, and the Americans are still delaying giving her a visa to come for our son's graduation in two weeks. Shakun and I met, we married, we had two boys early on, and um, my life began to be anchored in, in Nepal. I worked, started working with Save the Children with Thai, with Cambodian refugees in my route, you know, um, refugee camp on the Thai-Cambodian border in 81. And Scott spent the rest of his career and life with Cambodians on the border, then to, to roam for a couple of years with WFP, and then for the last 25 years or so in Phnom Penh, married to a very famous, um, respected human rights politician, Sukua Mu, um, and made his life there. I came back to Nepal. And um, I started working with Save the Children. I stayed with Save the Children for 25 years. And um, with the refugee camp, starting a Thai country program, and then um, coming to Nepal in 83, I basically worked for Save the Children, whether it was a country, regional, Asia regional, Nepal, Bhutan, for um, 24 years or so. And I just loved it. I mean, it was just you know, such, you know, such rewarding work. I was paid to walk around the Himalaya. I liked that part. You know, there was such need at that time in Nepal. We were doing literacy classes, we were doing small-scale enterprise, we were doing training of female health volunteers, trying to triangulate between, say, the children as an external agent with local government at the district level and national ministerial work, where there was an education, health, economic development, things of that sort. Had a big neonatal program. My father came once, who was an OBGYN. He did the first ring pessary camp, I think, in, in, in Nepal at that time. So you know, my life continued through this work with Save the Children, as you'll see here, you know, country director, regional director, and then when Save finally said, who do you love more, Save the Children or Nepal? And I put my fingers behind my back and crossed them, and I said, I'll only know when I leave one of them. But for me, there was no choice. I mean, an agency or an institution in a country with its culture, history, people, language, et cetera. So when Save finally, after 25 years, looked in my folder and file and realized I'd been there for 25 years, <clears throat> Um, came up with a five-year rule that you could only be in a job in a country for five years and then, you know, <laughs> tried to bribe me to go to Ethiopia. We'll give you $10,000. For $10,000, I never would have started this work, yeah? <laughs> if I wanted real money, that was not where I was going to do it or go to the headquarters. So I stayed in Nepal. By that time, married, kids. There's a world there. We each of us create a world wherever we're living, and mine happened to be Kathmandu. And then I started to work for the UN, UNDP, with the National Human Rights Commission. As I'll say in a minute, there was a conflict going on, a Maoist civil war going on in Nepal, a lot of rights issues. I was there for a couple of years. Then I was asked to help with the civil society work as Nepal drafted a new constitution as one of the ways of ending the civil conflict, the civil war. Fascinating work for a few years. Now I'm working with the bank on a local governance accountability program with transparency, budget issues, Office of the Auditor General, basically national institutions and bringing those down to the community level. So six weeks, I was invited to come to Nepal. I was actually kicked out of Thailand because I insulted a senior government official. I was a little bored working in Bangkok and I asked him if he'd read the proposal and he looked at me and I knew at that moment that I wasn't gonna stay in that job. <laughs> and say the children offered me to work in Nepal for six weeks, that six weeks became from 83 until, until Tuesday evening. You know, our program in the community, these are my three kids, Leah, Ezzy, and Joshu. You know, my life became Kathmandu. Um, and I've seen a lot of change, as people say. Anyone who's been to Nepal or been there you know, in the 80s or 70s till today, what the modern world has done to a lot of Asian cities, you know, what a lot of Asian cities have done to themselves in modern times is, is tragic, painful to see. The top picture is Ring Road, Chakrapat, which goes around Kathmandu. That was in the um, early 80s. The lower picture is the Kathmandu Valley today, which has nearly three million people um, and this ring road on both sides, you don't see green is only something you could see on a signboard 
Um, you wouldn't see rice fields, you wouldn't see anything. It's just been overwhelmed, this, this valley. The hills in the background, in the top picture are the hill and the lower picture to the left. Our house is up on that ridge going up. We moved out of the city to, um, to be able to, you know, to um, enjoy the environment and to make a life for ourselves. But the city is absolutely overwhelmed, which is why when the earthquake struck, most of us thought 100,000 people would, would be killed because of the construction. You know, the valley is, is built on an old lake, they say, so, you, so it's very soft soil. Um, that didn't happen. But as you can look at any of these statistics, you know, the per capita, per capita income of Nepal is $2,400, which is an interesting figure because what the government's offering, I'll show later, in terms of people rebuilding their houses is $2,000. You know, and 25% enrollment in primary school to 90% today, but the real number is how many people grad, how many children graduate from high school, and then how many girls graduate, or how many Dalits or Tamangs or the, the uh, more marginalized caste communities. The migration, you have 40,000 people leaving Nepal a month to go work in Malaysia, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Israel, anywhere. You know, huge external migration because there's no economy basically in Nepal, and that's one of the great tragedies. You know, that we're exporting our labor, but they're going to countries except for Australia, America, England, where they can't settle. My generation, our generation in Nepal, I mean, my joke is Nepal slept through the 20th century and woke up in the 21st with a severe migraine. You know, it was basically a closed country. The, the doyen of, of expatriate Americans just passed away a couple weeks ago, Barbara Adams, who came in the, in the 60s. And the beauty of Kathmandu also from our, my perspective is this expatriate community that's been there for 30, 40 years, anthropologists, mountain climbers, diplomats, art thieves, you know, development people. Um, it's just a you know, fascinating world. Scots Cambodia, because of year zero in the Khmer Rouge, People came in the 80s and 90s. It's a different world, the type of people who lingered in Nepal. And um, both my sons went for two years to Northfield Mount Hermon. My daughter's going there in the fall. And I say that because they have a guest house. I was staying there at the guest house. And um, John Irving, the, the novelist, son was there. His wife is a big contributor. And we were staying in the same guest house. We were all chatting. And I said, I'm from Nepal. And she looked at me. She goes, you're from Nepal? I said, yeah, I've been there since the 80s. She, she said, you could stay? I said, yeah, she goes, I did. She goes, I didn't know you could stay. I would have stayed if I knew you could stay. <laughs> I mean, it was a special place back then, a little less special now, but still an yeah, amazing place. So just quick history, there will be no quiz. 1960 is when there was a first democratic election and then immediately followed by a coup by the king because he didn't like the results. 20 years went by, this is when we first came, Lee and Scott and I in 79. There was a referendum that you know, the government twisted and they turned down having democracy. 1990, streets covered with United Marxist Leninist Party, Congress Party, and the king had to fold and allow there to be multi-parties. Soon after, the Maoists started a civil war, posted 40, 40 demands on you know, the, the, the church in Worms and said, you know, unless you, uh, you know, make these changes, we're going to war. So from 96 to 2006, there was an ugly little war, about 14, 15,000 people died. The country just wasn't able to get on its feet. 2006, they signed that Comprehensive Peace Accord. That's when I left SAVE and went to the Human Rights Commission. And then 2008, the first Constituent Assembly, which was a demand to write a new constitution. It never did get the constitution written, but it did depose the royalty. 2014, they finally did have a new CA, a new election, and they approved the federal constitution right after the, the, the earthquake last year, which is what happens sometimes when in these in political environments that the people running the country will take advantage of a natural disaster to do things that otherwise they couldn't get done. And there's still that constitution is, is not accepted by a large part of the country. The earthquake struck just a little over a year ago. And the country is still trying to wake up from this earthquake and adjust to it. Um, you know, some of the common words, adhikar, rights, andalan, movement, banda, strike, chaka jam, Chuck is a wheel, you know, break, he's jamming the wheel, nothing can move, Jalus demonstrations. John Yuda, a civil war. Jubber Justy is a good one because Jubber Justy is what anyone refers to about the Maoists. You know, they were good Maoists, they were serious. They didn't murder as many people as a real war would have, but they were very targeted and they were serious Maoists and everyone referred to them as Jubber Justy, which means by force of will. They would insist whatever they wanted had to be done, <clears throat> even when they were out of power. What makes it interesting for me personally is I was once in the kitchen in the back and the Didi's, the women who work in the house, were calling, talking about my daughter who was about two or three years old at that time. 
I go, what did you just say? He said, ah, she's so jubber justy. I was going, Jesus, that's the, the only other time I hear that is about the Maoists. And my daughter has the same force of will personality. <laughs> I've learned a lot more since then. Karbai is action. Action means harming someone. So you'd hear this word karbai a lot. The Maoists would harm someone, break their arm, murder them, something of this sort. This is the world we lived in. Earthquake struck. This is one of the old royal cities in the valley. There are three of them, very beautiful, but this is where you see this temple's coming down. As they say about the Spanish Inquisition, no one expects an earthquake to happen the moment of your life. But being aware of it, I mean, there are times I'm walking around Kathmandu, I was always aware <clears throat> this place is supposed to be ready. The last one was 70, 80 years ago. And um, at any point, this could happen again, because it's you know, the meeting of two continents, of the, you know, the Central Asian, Tibetan Plateau, and South Asia. And um, the fault lines are very severe. And the 1934 earthquake caused tremendous damage to all the old temples and palaces and piazzas. I mean, I like to say Kathmandu has the most beautiful piazzas after Italy. So here's one that was taken, I think, in Sindhu Palchok, just northeast of Kathmandu Valley. I had some friends who were out in the hills that day and they said boulders were just bouncing off the ridges and coming down and they were just looking up as they're trying to find a safe place to be. And they're very steep, narrow gorges, I mean for anyone who's trekked and been outside the Kathmandu Valley. And now you see the scars everywhere of these landslides that were caused. The monsoon just started the other day. I left on Tuesday. Yeah, um, likely to be a lot of natural disasters, flooding, landslides, settlements being destroyed because of this. Some of the figures, 7.8 magnitude, nearly 9,000 people killed, 20,000 injured, 650 homes collapsed. Basically, Kathmandu, they didn't. The, the concrete houses in this, by and large, you know, survived. I mean, we'll come to the media in a moment, too, but you know, the media, from what you'd see on TV, and we were watching CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, etc., you'd think the whole city collapsed, but I could drive from my home <clears throat> 10 kilometers into the city, and not till we got to the Royal Palace and the walls had collapsed in places, <clears throat> would, you, would you know there'd been a big earthquake? <clears throat> the power of the media and what it shows. But in the hills and the mountains, all the clay and wattles houses, brick and stone, collapsed. 50,000 people displaced, 4,000 local schools destroyed. This is an interesting figure. It was a Saturday at noon. If it had been on a school day and those schools collapsed, those 4,000 schools, you could have had 75,000 children killed, not just 9,000 total. And then a few weeks later, there was a 7.4 earthquake. You know, one was on one side of Kathmandu, one on the other. There have been 455 aftershocks above four since then. I left Tuesday. My little sister from Dallas came to visit me first time since she came for our wedding. I left Tuesday, mo Monday night, one o'clock in the morning, 12:50 something. Really, the house began to shake, and you know, I just got up. Everyone out of the house. And Shakun says, "What are you yelling for?" I said, "Because Avery's here with Hank." You know, it's like so. It's just you know, felt like. 
here we go again. It's just this instability you feel, the psychological instability. It's like, how big is this one? What's happening next? What the hell's below us in this earth? And I'll have something to say about that later. So our house did quite well. It has 18 inch walls. We built it ourselves, big foundation. But when we went upstairs, um, there was some, um, you know, the bookshelves collapsed. For the next week or so, Shakunle and I slept in our um, Suzuki Grand Vitara in the driveway. Just, you're just insecure. You know, it really shakes you to your toes. Okay, that happened. Are we sitting on a precipice, you know, 20 kilometers below the earth? I have no idea. You know, so pillows and blankets, kids, let's go in the car. Um, this is where the earthquake took place. Those people who know Nepal can recognize it a little bit. Two concentric circles, you know, one on the west of Kathmandu, Gorkha, where the first one occurred, one on the east, where the second one occurred, you know, and Tibet to the north. Those people who don't know what Kathmandu is the same latitude as Orlando, Florida, and Aswan, Egypt. So, geography lesson. Um, surprising to many people. Um, then the most intensely affected districts, there are 11 or 14, depend how you count. Just in the mountains, just north of Kathmandu, you get up into the high Himalaya. Gorkha is the big red one on the left, where I had worked for years with Save the Children, the district I probably know best in the country. This is Bodhnath for people who know Nepal, the, you know, the major Buddhist monument in the city with its beautiful steeple. The steeple didn't collapse, but they took it down afterwards because it was so weakened, they're still repairing it. So these all-seeing eyes and the filigree above it, you know, they're still rebuilding this massive stupa on the edge of Kathmandu. As ugly and, and, you know, and unattractive as my beloved city is, it still has some of the most sacred, you know, remarkable religious sites in the world. Bodhnath is one, Pashupati, Swayambu. You know, magnificent places. Images of the schools, you know, village after the earthquake. Langtang Valley, again, for people who know Nepal, just due north, major trekking route, easy access high into the mountains. This is what Langtang looked like the day before the earthquake. You know, a hundred of these hotels and, and stone lodges. This is the only building that was left after the earthquake. The sacred mountain above that village, be careful of who you pray to, the sacred mountain above that village basically had a huge landslide, collapsed and just buried that town. And a few hundred Nepalis and a few dozen um, foreigners who were in trekking lodges there. Um, and this one building that was against the ridge is the one that survived. Within a day, hours, I was sending an email to friends explaining what happened, asking for support to help us in this situation. A woman, Joanna Donovan, who knew us in, in Ann Arbor, in, in um, where are you from, Gary? From Madison. From Madison, wrote me immediately and said, you don't remember me, I know you, la, la, la. She goes, what you're doing is, listen, I gotta give you some advice. If you do, ask people to send checks in the way you're doing, 30% is gonna go for banking fees. I run a business in Kathmandu. She goes, give me a day, I'll figure something out. And Joanna, bless her heart, set up this um, GoFundMe site, which we call the Nepal Villagers Earthquake Fund, and this is a recent screenshot, you know, nearly $200,000, you know, and almost all my friends in this audience and others contributed generously to, um, to this fund that we used to support Shakun's NGO, the Buddhist, Buddhist Janati Kar Forum, Buddhist People's Rights Forum, to do work in villages, immediate relief. And it was just a tremendous vehicle, and Joanna negotiated with them not to take a percentage, and the percentage that they had to take, they recontributed to the Nepal Red Cross very dear people. Immediately through Shakun's NGO, we needed a structure. You couldn't get supplies in Kathmandu. Every, Kathmandu was fine in many, many ways. I mean, you know, certain things were terribly destroyed. The supplies you couldn't get, because everyone was looking for supplies. She had her friends from the Terai, from the down, you know, in the southern plains of Kathmandu, bring up the goods that we were packing, individual family packs of rice and lentils and soap and candle, things of this oil, just for immediate food. Josh and I took one trip up just across the valley from Barpak, where the epicenter was. Gatchok's over here. They're both probably about 8,000 feet with 20,000 mountain foot mountains behind them. But we went up and we took a, about five trucks and tractors up there. Up through the night, we started in the middle of the day. Everything kept getting delayed, typical Nepali things. And we ended up in, you know, we were going through these villages and the truck was sliding because there were slate, villa, slate stone houses Gurung villages that had littered the, the, the trail. So the truck was slipping on this slate because all the buildings collapsed. We got in the morning to Gyachok and with the local Red Cross, you can see some pictures of the houses destroyed up there. This is Josh and um, 
um, um, big yacht in the center who were helping to organize all of this. Interesting, raising money, friends, people you know, the media comes in, natural disaster, they're there, here today, gone to Maui, went from 300 articles a day, this is like a global search on Nepal, to earthquake happens, 33,000 articles in one day on Nepal and the earthquake. Spiked, the first earthquake, second one, less one, the world pays attention, everyone's there, and then they're gone. The other thing with the media is, the media loves Mount Everest. Mount Everest is something for me, but it's like, you know, people who climb El Capitan in, in Yosemite, if all the news about America was about people climbing El Tap Capitan in Yosemite, you'd miss a lot of America. For me, Nepal is what happens to the people in the country, not just Everest. On the earthquake site, for those people who were contributing, Josh did all this, these you know, infographics about what we did, who we helped, 40, 43,000 plus people reached, 51,000 kg of rice delivered, 12 of the 14 districts, 40 missions, etc. Very intensive time. You can imagine, you know, people are just lost and confused, lost their houses. Government's very hard to get organized. And another infographics about what we did, you know, it's on this Nepal Villagers Earthquake Fund site. I don't have to go into great detail. How the money was spent, tents and transportation, miscellaneous. You know, how much was left spent, you know, by October, there was still $13,000 left out of this nearly 200,000. And we got a wonderful contribution from some, from Mackenzie in Dubai, who had come with friends of Josh's from Georgetown or SOAS, I forget, and were there with us, and they stayed with us after the earthquake. One young Saudi guy and one Indian, and um, they were just such great guys. They went back and they raised um, $30,000 from their Mackenzie office to do the housing project that Josh was in charge of. So here you'll see the temporary housing, the bamboo frame that we're building up in Nuaco, just outside Kathmandu on the ridge. This is the finished, finished home. You know, and these are about $1,500 for each one of these homes. Now, I also do a, you know, have a day job um, a, you know, as a consultant to the World Bank. <clears throat> I just went out to Dolika, east of Kathmandu, to look at the startup of the National Reconstruction Authority housing project. Okay, we're building 20 houses. There's 650,000 houses that need to be rebuilt and the government is so slow and so bureaucratic and so corrupt and et cetera. Um, but I went out there, wrote a 10 page report to the bank and to the government about it. Major recommendations, because you think 650,000 houses need to be built. The government's promised them each $2,000 as I showed, that was just below the per capita. But it's not happening a year later, it's just not happening. So I'm saying simplify and expedite the process. It's supposed to be three tranches. I heard the bank talking about this based on Pakistan experience. We can't trust them, they'll spend the money in other ways for whatever they want to go watch a movie or something, buy a DVD. It's like we have to have engineers look and see that their houses are being built by our standards. Such a laborious process, such great potential for corruption. So what I was telling them is, one, two, three tranches, it has to be done in three to six months. Don't let this delay for years as things happen in Nepal. Finalize the time frame to get 100% of the enrollment of the households. Increase that they have certain designs, you have to follow one of their designs, but they talk about this being owner generated, but they come up with these designs that it costs, you know, more than $2,000, two lakh, four lakh, eight lakh. It's like they're, they're Kathmandu centric in their thinking. Let people build the houses they wanted and streamline the grievance mechanism with some type of accountability and registration numbers. Because if people aren't getting the money or someone's trying to, you know, as they will, ask for part of the money, how do they get some, some grief, how do they speak to someone? A lot of issues with, with natural disasters and the developing country, and even if it was, you know, here in the States, as you've seen, whether it's New Orleans or the Jersey Shore. The bureaucracy, major political party greed in a country like we have in Nepal. Still, there's a lot of caste, gender exploitation. Who runs the government? These are mostly Tamang Gurungs up in the hills who, who lost their houses. They're not the people in the government. I was mentioning the environmental damage, the psychosocial anxiety. You know, even the other night, it's like, God, do we have, how much do we have to go through this? And we have a, you know, a home we built that's very well established. Imagine for other people up in those hills. This whole foreign humanitarian, you know, work is a very complex perspective from local societies. Who are these foreigners running around with their big salaries, their big cars, making money off us? How much money, and I was thinking this the other day too, how much money has been spent giving to the people who lost their houses based on it's got to be tens of millions of dollars spent already by the whole development industry to help these people? But they're still so bureaucratic that the people aren't getting the money, but we're all making our money, and the people are flying from all over the world to come into Nepal. 
So the image of us as trespassers, and then the evangelical thing is, you know, people are deeply concerned in Nepal. Um, as I was saying earlier, media, what does the media pay attention? The lack of a long-term vision is really one of the cruel things for, you know, moving the country ahead after a natural disaster like this. As I was saying, you know, um, we live um, on unstable ground um, in places that are earthquakes, even more so. You know, the Lisbon earthquake, a Kathmandu earthquake, it changes people's psychology and, and how they perceive and their sense of confidence and security. This is a quote from a, um, a, a geologist report, you know, basically saying that the upper half is continuing to build up pressure and has potential for a much greater impact than the break that occurred in April 2015, just to make us feel better about our lives. Which is why Nepalis pray to Bhairab, the god of, god of time, the protector and destroyer of the realm. This is a big Bhairab in Kathmandu, Durbar Square, you know, and I'm sure my friends who've been there remember it well, but Nepalis Bay and large, their force is so much bigger than their lives and their government to whom they pay obeisance and respect because they know we live in fragile times and fragile life. But at the end, nature always wins. This is my backyard. When I need a moment of peace, I sit in that chair. We planted 40 to 50 types of bamboo in this yard. And this is where I find my solace when the world seems a little too troubled. Thank you very much. So exam will be Friday, and it's like, if you still haven't turned in your papers, there's no way you're graduating this year. <laughs> um, questions, thoughts? Will there be a field trip this time this morning? <laughs> you have to do it in Kathmandu. The Indian blockade. Yeah. Right, I mean, for people who are your daughter, sons in Nepal, they're on every summer, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you, and you've been there once a couple times? Yeah, so people who know Nepal, you know, the politics, you know, if you, if you can't imagine politics worse than, Nepal, than the United States, if you think the politics in the United States are so bad, we do, um, try Nepal. So, you know, we, I think there was a point on one of those slides, we've had like one prime minister every 11 months since 1990. Um, so a lot of instability. This past, I said the constitution wasn't accepted by a lot of the people in the tribe, Madeshis, Tarus, other indigenous, Janjati. It was driven home, kind of like the counter-reformation, you know, all the work that we did, I did on it, you know, was basically pushed to the side. So um, there's still a lot of demonstrations, a lot of anger about this constitution. 40 people were killed in the demonstrations in the fall. And the Indian government has a little influence on Nepal because by and large were surrounded by India. They, even though they didn't acknowledge it, they shut the border um, in the fall and didn't let fuel and other things come in. We're totally dependent on India. So, you know, I was bicycling to work. I was in much better shape than I am now. And um, it had a huge impact on the economy. It basically shut down any economic growth from last year. Um, and it was the Indians' fault as well as the Nepalese, you know, for just not resolving, you know, if you're not going to straighten out your own house, other people are going to play. I mean, sometimes I think of Nepal as like the Alsace-Lorraine of South Asia. You know, con and it, more in play now than it's ever been with huge Chinese influence now in, in Nepal. Geopolitically, the Americans have basically given over their, their, their authority to the Indians, and the Chinese are, you know, bringing huge resources into Nepal. And Nepal is upset with India because of the blockade, and so they're trying to get closer to the Chinese. It's, you know, it's not the South China Sea or Latvia or Ukraine, but... It's problematic, to say the least. So it had, a, it had a major impact on people's lives. And a lot of people are very angry, pissed off, you could say, with the Indians since then. For a country that basically speaks a similar language, same culture, you know, the royal family was related to theirs. It's like, you know, there are a million plus, two million Nepalese working in India. It's visa-free travel. Not good to have such a bad relation with your big, big neighbor. Please. Is there a future for the Sherpas? There are two, um, you know, until we're dead, there's always a future. Um, for the Sherpas, there's a movie, I think, something Everest that came out last year that was a Hollywood film. That wasn't bad for a Hollywood film. But there's a documentary called Sherpa that was in the Academy Awards last year that's a brilliant film. This year was the earth, last year was the earthquake. The year before that, there was, a, there was an ice fall, um, an avalanche on the, the um, 
you know, the path up to Everest that killed something like 14, 20 Samad Sherpas. There was an Australian woman there making a, a documentary of the Nepali, Aung Sring something Sherpa possibly, who was gonna summit again Everest and break the record for one person going up to Everest. She was doing a documentary on him. This ice fall happened, this, and um, so many Sherpas were killed. Sherpas said, we're not going up this year. Westerners were there, we want to go. She filmed all this hala, as you would say in Nepali, all this like, controversy there at the Everest Base Camp, and she made a beautiful film called Sherpa that talks about the Sherpas, um, that is a documentary. It's really insightful about Sherpa culture from the Nepali perspective. I mean, you foreigners, guys, give us a fucking break. It's like, you want to climb, you have this like fixation to be on the top of Everest. Our cousin brothers and sons just died and we're simply not interested this year. Give it a pass. But no, we're here, we paid our money and it's really interesting. And that puts it a little too much in black and white, but it's a little bit like that because there are nuances on both sides. Really worth seeing that movie for people interested in Nepal and the Sherpas. My friend Brock Coburn, who wrote the, the National Geographic book on Everest, who I just saw the other day in Kathmandu, he, is, he knows the Sherpas very well, he lived up there. He thinks the Sherpas um, um, get more attention than, than they need. The Sherpas are one of the wealthiest communities in Nepal. They're incredibly successful people, and there are a lot of them in the United States. So um, among Tamangs, Tarus, you know, Rai, Limbu, Dalits, Sherpas have done very well, thank you very much. You know, um, very smart, very entrepreneurial. They had the foreigners there for a long time. My wife belongs to the Takali, um, ethnic group on Mustang, Takola, Johnson, people who know that. They control that salt trade for 120 years or so. Also considered one of the like, you know, more clever communities in Nepal. So Sherpas, Takalis, both Janjati, indigenous, mount, you know, mountain people, but quite successful as a generalization. Bob? I don't, I don't do naive questions. <laughs> And from you, I don't believe it. But. <laughs> so, so you have this experience of grassroots earthquake relief. Azure. Sure. self-organized True. And my, and my understanding is you, you weren't alone. There were other organizations. Good point. Good point. There were other Absolutely. What did this mean for the development or not of something you might call sort of civil society? Yeah, great question. And, and is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, no and yes. Um, without a good government, government, governance, I mean, it's a country of nearly 30 million people now. I mean, civil society can do so much. You know, so the weakness in governance, until that's resolved in some way, in some stability, you know, it's going to be very difficult for Nepal. Um, I mean, we haven't built a hydro project in 20 some odd years. I mean, you know, the corruption, et cetera. I mean, I gave some of that. Civil society, you know, was remarkable when this happened. And yes, the positives in Nepal are that when I first went there in the early 80s, um, I'd meet people in the hills of Gorka who'd fought for the British in, in the Italian campaign and in Egypt and things of this sort. Great stories. Now, the young Nepalis coming back have been to, you know, Amherst or Harvard or Hopkins or Berkeley. It's like, you know, they're very smart. People are smart. Give them the opportunity. And um, many stay in the States. You know, my cousin, Shakun's cousin, is you know, living in Mill Valley. And I tell her, wait, that was supposed to be my life. I was supposed to be in Mill Valley. You were supposed to be in Kathmandu. You know, but she was an endocrinologist, and I never did that. So you do have a lot of young Nepalis who are as sophisticated. The gap, when Shakun and I got married, the generation before Shakun, her family said to her cousin sister, older cousin sister, who married a Newar across culture, when you see her walk across the street, yeah? Not permitted. Shakun and I were the next wave. You know, it's like Shakun, you know, was very well educated, father was educated. Now, but the relationship in terms of worldly knowledge, books, literature, history, you know, culture, languages, was such a large gap. Now, you know, almost feel seamless with many of the young Nepalis in their 30s and, and 20s and some in their 40s. Just, you know, it's like a frozen, you know, Nepal's frozen with this generation of people you know, in their 70s who won't give up power. When the people who are 40s come into power, I still have great hopes for Nepal, but, you know, Abraham Joshua Heschel, I'm an optimist against my better judgment. Yeah? But something will come for Nepal. Civil society was remarkable. Mix of the Westerners and Nepalis. You know, we were just one. There were hundreds of these you know, sites and self-organizing. It was just remarkable to see how well they got. 
you know, mapping, where, where's the need, who's gone where, come on, you're all doing your own thing, you're, you're tripping over each other. You know, you have the UN agencies, World Food, UNICEF, very expensive, quite professional, save the children, um, but societies will only develop if they do it themselves, yeah? And that's what you need. The UN needs to move out of the way and let these societies stand up, fall down, do it, and we saw remarkable things happening then, and, um, you know, very impressive. I mean, I there's a whole subject in there, but you're absolutely right. It showed the potential of civil society in Nepal, and this hegemonic he he Kathmandu reaching out to help people around the country. Keith, I want to take this in a bit of a different direction here. One of your early slides. Um, in terms of, you know, you've been trying to do long-term help. Right. How do you see it going just in terms of the population, the demographics? How is that going to work long-term? Yeah, I mean... It, What's not there? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's a remittance economy now. Remittances are equal, more than equal to all of the development aid and all of the foreign, all of the export income from Nepal. Remittances, people sending money back from Qatar, Saudi Arabia. I'm sure people have seen the FIFA scandals building, the Nepalese dying building the, the World Cup stadiums in Qatar. Um, it brings a lot of money in. There's something positive about the remittances as well. Everything, you know, has, you know, um, you know, um, alternative perspective or a way of seeing the, the benefit of it. It screws up families a lot, husbands go away, problems occur, they send a lot of money back. The changes you've seen in, in health indicators, infant, child, mortality, maternal, part of that's the development work. I give credit to SAVE and the other agencies. I think we did a lot of good work, you know, um, and it was useful at the time. I'm just more, que you know, I have questions about the model needs to change. A lot of the, the development indicators have changed because households have more money because of the income that's coming from outside for healthcare, for private education, English education in all these villages, et cetera. Um, the demographics is a tough one. The, um, the, the, um, you know, the um, 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 number of children you know, that women are having has dropped significantly. You know, but you're racing against the infant child mortality. And I, sometimes in the 80s and 90s, I was questioning, why are we doing so much on infant child mortality? Because the country can't support all these people. You know, there's a certain point where you reach where the replacement number is, you know, um, softens the rapid, it's easier to drop the, num the child infant mortality than it is to get the family planning numbers, you know, and the reproductive numbers down. So it's a problem, you know. India is always the great outlet for, for Nepal. I said there are two million plus Nepalis working there. Growing economy in India helps Nepal. You know, as much as Nepal has very strong nationalist feelings these days, hyper-nationalist, um, India is, it's a part of the greater Indian world, which is a debate that Nepalis you know, um, find very sensitive. So there is that, that outlet for, for people to get jobs, but Nepal needs its own economy. And it's basically a rentier economy now, and it has to do with the political class, and it has to do with the narrow mentality of politicians, you know, who don't know anything better than extracting as much as they can as quickly as they can. So there are serious problems in Nepal. There's no doubt. Dear. Yeah. I mean, it's a you know whole separate discussion. This you know Indian-China relationship and you know, Nepal in between. You know um, the Chinese are incredibly sensitive. To anything on its border, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is getting older. You know he may be His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You know this too shall pass. Yeah, as my friend Christopher says, no one gets out alive. Yeah, so His Holiness will pass at some point, and then there's a major political catharsis going to happen. Nepal borders Tibet. You know, it's extremely sensitive. There are police cameras, you know, CCTVs all over Boda, wherever the Tibetans live. The one thing the Chinese want out of the Nepali government is security. They want to control the police. They want to control you know, the border areas. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're micromanaging that part of the Nepali economy. And they want business. They want the hydro, want these other things, makes the Indians nervous. Um, and the influence has just gotten greater and greater. But, China's got its own problems, obviously. You know, Nepal is not the biggest of its worries, but any country that borders China knows the influence that country has. And you know, with all due respect to the Chinese and what they've done for their own people, et cetera, et cetera, it's not benign by any means. Um, and um, it's a very authoritarian state, and sometimes we wonder if Nepal 
is in moving from this fragile democracy to a more authoritarian state under the influence of one of its neighbors. Please. Right. I mean, tourism. Positive things. Yeah, Nepal is one of the loveliest countries in the world. The people are so. I mean, it's just you know, they're so charming. It's you know, coming through the airport, it's like you come into through a Nepali airport, hope, hopelessly confused, chaotic, disorganized. The people are so sweet. It's like you know, you need help, you something. I always like smiling. Help. You come into the Western American airport, very efficient, but you know, people are a little more reserved or cold or efficient or you know, demanding. <laughs> Um, so it's a lovely country to visit. Mustang, you know, north of where my wife's village is, that whole Kaligandaki Valley, Lomantang, the greatest Tibetan murals, you know, Buddhist murals for 3,000 miles in any direction, maybe 5,000 miles, is an incredible place to visit if no one's been there. Right on the Tibetan border, it used to be Lomantang, southern Tibetan kingdom 500 years ago. Absolutely remarkable Tibetan Buddhist art. So the tourism absolutely come to Nepal. It's just a fantastic experience. My sister from Dallas, who hasn't been there since we got married in 88, is there now, and I'm Facebooking her saying, what are you doing there when I'm here now? But she came because her daughter volunteered. She worked for a, um, an Israeli-American NGO that does like an eight-month Peace Corps, and she had a great experience. So my sister and her husband and her brother came to visit her. So, and you know, they're not big travelers. They're loving it. They're having a great time. Um, Education, education, education. You know, after years of development work, if I could say, if people want to invest outside of Kathmandu, please, outside of Kathmandu, build great schools, have great teachers. You know, whether it's the Northfield Mount Hermans or Amherst or public school system, the public school system's horrific. Give these kids, it's a very hierarchical society, very caste, ethnic, tribal type society. You know, very homo hierarchous, as the anthropologist said. For the Tarus, who I love, out in the mid far west Nepal, you know, very gentle people have been totally taken advantage of with the modernization. You know, I would always hire Tarus. I've got a very good friend trying opportunities. You know, SAVE, when I ran SAVE, was known to be the most inclusive international organization in Kathmandu because we put a lot of emphasis. Get the Tamangs in here. They shouldn't only be the drivers and chokidars, the guards. It's crazy. So we began to put Tamang language preferred when we were working up in Tamang areas in the, in the early 90s. You know, Try to even, it's what Amherst has been doing, what I understand, in terms of, you know, come on. It's like, it doesn't always have to be like this. So, but people need an education. You want an opportunity in this world. You know, Take, who works for us, would be a brilliant engineer. He can fix everything. Instead, he's like a night guard because, you know, he came from the hills at Tamang, never had that opportunity. So education, and then let people create their own societies, and it takes a long time. Yeah, we didn't create this society, you know. These were Europeans who came to America, yeah. Um, so, you know, be patient with Nepal. Don't always look for the short-term solution and um, pull back some of the Western, you know, development assistance and, you know, create institutions that have long-term viability. Please. Hi. Hi. Uh, you have such an amazing passion for what you do. It's obvious. And I just got off the airplane. It'll come down. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I'm even one. Um, you know, um, um, we all mentor people. We're at that point again, linear, you know, your own career, your own education, your own wealth, your own number of kids, et cetera. You know, turning back to oneself is also not necessarily just, you know, you know um, about oneself. You know, it's what you offer to the world in those non, you know, linear, you know, categories. You know, many of my friends who are doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, they're mentoring people in their institutions. You know, um, I love, you know, people in their 20s and, you know, who are coming to Nepal. I can't believe the city is so grotesque. It's like they fall so much in love. It's like, okay, it's like, if you think so. You know, it's a, to help them find ways to, to assist, to, to nurture their careers. Young Nepalis, particularly from, you know, Taru, Dali, Tamangs, these more exploited, marginalized communities, would always you know, give preference to hiring them because any organization you work for, given that there aren't so many business opportunities, 
particularly if agencies like SAVE put a lot of emphasis on human development for the, anyone in the organization, give them the opportunity. They can all become much more than they were when they started. So that type of mentoring, you know, for whether they're foreigners, you know, or Nepali's preference, women, young Nepali women. I just was on a board for Dalit scholarship and, you know, and I couldn't go because I just had an operation a couple weeks ago and I said, so I went through and I said, but this is my priority, this, a Dalit woman from the Chirai, I think this woman is, could be one of the best candidates. That's my bias and my interest because you have Dalits from the hills, these untouchable castes, and you have Dalits, untouchable castes from the Tri. The ones in the Tri, the Indian border areas, are much poorer and disadvantaged. So trying to move opportunities and create opportunities and, and guide people and use stand as references. And My son's actually in Nepal working, um, but I'm not sure he would take his father as his reference for his um, <laughs> profession, but maybe somewhere in there. He's working on open data for a British NGO um, non-government organization, and I think open data, this whole budget, you know, transparency, you know, we don't need to be doing the early childhood development now, that's really, is the, you need a government to do that, but people need to hold their government accountable, so I think Josh is the new wave of things of this sort, and my other son's about to graduate with a South Asia anthropology history degree, um, so let's see what happens in the future, please. Yeah, I mean, I have an Austrian, an Austrian friend who helped um, on the Patton Museum, for people who know it, the Garden of Dreams. These are exquisite places. A wonderful guy, Thomas Schrum. And um, he's working at UNESCO, and his wife came over to see me the other day, and um, she said that whatever hair Thomas has left, he's quickly, it's, it's so damn political. The Department of Archaeology doesn't want the foreigners to do it. People see money to be made. Who gets the contracts? People have no skills. There's another guy, Gertz um, um, Hagmuller, who's Central European, German, Austrian. Some of these brilliant guys who've been in Nepal longer than I have, since the 70s, working on the Bakhtapur restoration. These are brilliant people um, who've done incredible projects there. Um, you know, their standard is so beautiful. The government is just in, they're seeing this as an opportunity to make too much money. So there are some good non-government organizations, Kathmandu Valley Trust Preservation are wor is working. Slowly, there's no reason to rush in this, particularly if it's going to be done, you know, poorly or, or cheaply. Better to take their time. Um, but there are the skills there and people who have those skills. Um, but it was a lot of devastation of that national heritage. And unique, and as I say, outside of Italy, the best piazzas in the world are in Kathmandu. Most of the people, Most of the people if you ask my wife, who's head of the Buddhist, Buddhist People's Rights Forum, I mean, like this. Um, I didn't mean it, Shakun. I didn't mean it. Um, she, um, she would say they were Buddhists before they were Hindus. You know, they're, they're mythological people. I think, you know, by and large, they're more Hindu, um, very power, strong Buddhists, the mountain people, the Tibetans, others. You know, Buddha was born in Nepal, as the Nepalis like to say, and I always say, but Nepal didn't exist at that time. How was the Buddha? Well, I mean, Jesus was born in, like, Eretz, Israel. I mean, it's but they're very affectionate. They, I mean, there's they, they, you know, certain insecurity there. By and large, Hindu, animist, Buddhist. Where Buddha was born in Lumbini, mostly Muslims now, the Christian population is growing a lot. Um, so it's modern times. You know, Kali Yuga is what they say, the black age, the end of time. But by and large, it's a very Hindu country. The new constitution separated Hinduism from the state. Major dramatic change. I had it in a slide, I took it out. It's now a federal republic secular federal republic of Nepal. It wasn't those things before this new constitution. It's a republic, no king, it's secular, no religion. It's meant to be federal, but they're still debating those state issues. Huge cultural change, because I mean, you still have Hindu temples and all the police chokes and the military barracks and things of this sort, so. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. <laughs>